hi, hello, this is very important, so please listen up. This video that you're watching right now is absolutely going to get mass reported by McKamey Manor's cult-like following. They did it to Reckless Ben, and they won't stop there. Come here. Oi. That kitty. One, if I have been reported for copyright infringement or trademark infringement, I'm not claiming to be McKamey Manor. I'm not impersonating McKamey Manor. I am not using their name to cause confusion or deception. This video that you're watching right now does not qualify as that at all. Two, as far as copyright infringement goes, I will put the information on the screen here, but all the clips used in this video are being used well within the bounds of the fair use doctrine. This is not a re-upload of anything McKamey Manor or Russ McKamey owns that would serve as a replacement for the actual content. This is an informational video essay and I am an independent journalist just compiling information from the internet and other sources and compiling them into one video. Three, as far as the privacy complaint tool goes, using it to suggest that this video is a privacy violation of Russ McKamey or McKamey Manor would be misuse of the tool under penalty of perjury. Russ McKamey is is a public figure. He has appeared in mainstream media news outlets, a Netflix documentary, and an upcoming Hulu documentary. Four, this video is not made to defame, slander, or otherwise harm Russ McKamey as a person or McKamey Manor as an entity. Defamation and slander requires that a person knowingly spreads false information. Everything I'm telling you in this video is alleged or my opinion. You can go and research these things for yourself afterwards. And finally, number five, this is long, I'm so sorry, please stick with me. <laughs> Videos about McKamey Manor usually get age restricted or demonetized right away. So YouTube, hi, I'm specifically talking to you. When I inevitably have to request a review, please hear this, I am actively trying trying my hardest and going out of my way to make sure that this video meets community guidelines. I'm not showing any clips that might disturb some viewers. I'm censoring the crap out of a lot of this, a lot of words, a lot of visuals. I'm trying my best. All right, did I cover my butt enough here? I think I might've covered my butt enough. Please don't take this video down when it inevitably gets mass reported YouTube. Please understand that they are just angry that their cult, <coughs> I mean the manor, <laughs> Just, just McKamey Manor. Along with Russ McKamey's mask, uh, it's, it's just crumbling out of control. The mask is falling off and they don't like that. So the control that Russ McKamey has had over people in the past is slipping through his fingertips. No more Russ McKamey. He was supposed to be the biggest extreme haunt there was. Russ is gonna take me for everything I got. Like, I can't speak on this. It was a lure to get people on video camera. The look in their eye when they thought they were gonna die, you guys, this isn't a joke. There's something wrong with him. He wanted the humiliation, the terror. He lured people with an illusion. I mean, it was nothing other than an illusion. You want the truth or you want a good lie? Russ is McKamey Manor. This video is sponsored by Raycon. If you haven't heard of Raycon before, where, um, <clears throat> where have you been? <laughs> We all know that Raycon is an industry leader in premium wireless earbuds. You may have even heard how they hold their anniversary sales every year. Well, this year, Raycon is turning six. And in the past six years, Raycon has really made a name for themselves in the premium audio space with products like these. These are their everyday earbuds known for delivering high quality audio and thoughtful features like a 32 hour battery life and a perfect in-ear fit for all day wear and lasting comfort. And all of that at half the price of 
other premium brands, it's no wonder that they've already racked up 78,000 five-star reviews. For real, guys, this is the first time I've ever actually tried Raycon. Obviously, I've heard of them a bazillion times before. Honestly, I'm blown away. Like, I have used other earbuds in the past, and I don't know if my ears are just, like, odd-shaped, <laughs> but nothing stays in my ears until Raycon. Like, look at this. They fit so well. What is even happening? And I know some of you know that I used to be in a band, so I spent a lot of money on in-ear monitors for stage performances and stuff. I would say these honestly fit better than those. And plus they're wireless, so like they're way more comfortable. It's wild. It's wild to me that these fit better than those. The weather in Arizona is finally cooling down so I can actually go outside for walks again. And I like to take Raycon with me while I roam my neighborhood playing Pokemon Go. I'm having a much more enjoyable experience being a Pokemon master now, thanks to the comfort and sound that I get from Raycon. And in this past year, they expanded their entire business with the introduction of Raycon Home and Raycon PowerTech. So needless to say, there's a lot to celebrate. To thank everybody who has shown Raycon support in the past six years, they're offering 20% off of everything site-wide. With select products, 40% off. Celebrate Raycon turning six with their biggest sale of the year going on now. Hurry now to buyraycon.com slash Savannah Marie and use the code BIRTHDAY to get 20 to 40% off site-wide. That's buyraycon.com slash Savannah Marie. Use the code BIRTHDAY and get 20 to 40% off site-wide. And please know that while you're also supporting a fabulous company and product like Raycon, when you order from this anniversary sale, you're also supporting my channel. So thank you to everybody who checks out this sponsor, who makes a purchase. You're supporting me, you're supporting Raycon, you're supporting premium wireless earbuds that sound great and feel great. And I think you'll love them because they really are great. Can I say great anymore? They're great! <laughs> Thank you again to Raycon for sponsoring today's video. Go check them out. They're fabulous. Now, on to some more less than happy things. Let's go. McKamey Manor always ends up being a hot topic around spoopy season every year. I actually made a video about it four years ago, but I took it down because honestly, I was contributing to the problem. I got so much stuff wrong and basically at the exact same time that I came out with that video, shit was hitting the fan with McKamey Manor. There are so many videos out there about this place, all touting it as the world's scariest haunted house. And as we'll uncover here, maybe it once was, 10 freaking years ago. Every year it gets covered by more people, for good reason. The interest in this topic is understandable, but the truth needs to get out there, and we need to finally stop Russ McCamey once and for all. McCamey Manor has been branded as the world's scariest and most extreme haunted house attraction, run by this dude named Russ McCamey. What started out as just a run-of-the-mill haunted house attraction in San Diego, it evolved to become more extreme over the years. Russ began turning this haunted house into a simulation of an abduction, where he would pick his participants up at a park, blindfold them, throw them into a van, beat them up a bit, and then use their greatest fears against them. At this point, the tours would last for hours. And after finally being run out of his original place in California, he bought a large rural property in Tennessee where he currently is. He claims to have over 80 different stunts that a person can do there, including a two mile long zip line, a 200 yard underwater swim filled with alligators that leads to an underwater haunted house, a 25 foot tall tightrope walk, Stunts involving snakes, rats, spiders, and so much more. There's only one problem though. All of those stunts don't exist. While it appears that McKamey Manor used to advertise truthfully in its early days, I am not convinced of that today in the year of our Lord 2023. Today, I would like to explore the history of McKamey Manor, uncover victims and their statements against Russ McCamey, and talk about its current state thanks to the expose being done by YouTuber Reckless Ben Schneider and his friend Danny Burke, which I highly recommend looking into after you finish this video, of course. It's a lot, so let's get started. I will say the history of McCamey Manor is so bizarre. If Russ wasn't such a monster, I'd almost feel bad for him in the way that what it started out as versus what it is today is just sad because it used to be something and now it's this. Go, 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 go. 
But let's not get ahead of ourselves. How did we get here? Well, McCamey Manor's history spans back to 2001 when Russ initially founded McCamey Manor out of his backyard in his San Diego home. The earliest video I can find is from 2007 when an old TV channel that hasn't existed for almost a decade now called FearNet did a segment on it. And this video seems actually pretty legit. In its early days, McCamey Manor was Russ's passion. He literally made his home into an extreme haunted house, one that you would expect to see in the neighborhood of some people who are really into Halloween. He even had one of his kids involved at the time. There's his now ex, Carol, who we will be profiling a little bit later on. This used to be a family thing. You can see in this footage that kids were able to go through McCamey Manor. It looks like Russ had the best of the best animatronics and special effects, and he came up with little mini attractions on his own. It was actually pretty creative and cool. The family clearly put a lot into it, like they were dedicated. Russ is wearing freaking prosthetics, look at that. McCamey Manor's first YouTube channel started in 2009, and you can see walkthroughs of the manor on these channels. There's literally three McCamey Manor channels over the years. This is when Russ started filming his quote unquote movies, as he calls them. It's basically Russ with a video camera in some poor person's face, so he's standing in front of them so they can't run out. There are actors popping out all over the place, screaming in their faces, and there's no way to escape once you're in there. However, even at this point, one could argue that it's all in good fun. It looks like the actors could maybe touch you, they could absolutely get uncomfortably close to you, but they couldn't grab you and hold you against your will or anything. No one was getting hurt, maybe they were peeing their pants, but no one is hurt. See, I feel like this stuff is actually really cool and creative. McCamey Manor was being featured on news outlets and the Travel Channel, and I believe that this attention is what enabled Russ to push the limit. By 2011, things began to escalate. Suddenly, the movies Russ made would show people laying in a coffin with an actor, people wearing ski masks, people being chained up and locked in freezers, and the actors were all over them. But even at this point, people weren't being hurt, just scared out of their minds. And there were plenty of, um, flims <laughs> up on YouTube depicting what went on inside the haunt. Russ would film walkthroughs, so nothing was a secret. If you were gonna go through McCamey Manor in 2011, you know you're gonna be more scared than you've probably ever been in your life, but you can still rest assured knowing that you aren't actually in real danger. Also, there's straight up kids still going through it at this point too. By 2012, you had to be 18 to enter and we started seeing duct tape blindfolds, coloring on people's faces and spitting in people's faces. Like that's completely unsanitary. In 2013, they advertised it as living your own horror movie, as well as no quitting no exceptions, and they were forcing people to eat gross stuff and making them vomit. And during this time, Russ started announcing that the manor would be moving to a new location, where things would get even more extreme! Spoiler alert, things didn't work out in Russ's favor. The new thing is that we're moving, so we're gonna be in a different location, so for you folks that want the extreme haunted house experience, this is it. A lot of folks thought we were gonna dumb down the experience once we move, we're not. It's gonna be even worse. The Haunters documentary actually captures this all going down, and I think that this was the pivotal point for McCamey Manor. So basically, Russ was a wedding singer at this place called Hazy Meadow Ranch. And from what I'm gathering, the owner was letting him build this new haunt experience on the property. After six months of work, a San Diego inspector showed up and shut the whole thing down because Russ apparently didn't have the proper permits and the ways to go about getting those permits were expensive to apply for and not even guaranteed to be granted. So Russ tore it all down. Six months of work for nothing. Russ alleges that he put hundreds of thousands of dollars into this project. But I fail to see where any of that money even came from, since his partner Carol was a paralegal, and I believe at this point Russ was only getting money from his Navy retirement, which couldn't have been much. It's easy for someone to see this and almost feel bad for Russ, until that is, you realize what it was he was actually building. The slabs 
would open up so the audience would be placed on this. They're refrigerated, electrified. They slide down a large apparatus into a funnel where only one opening was there for everybody to scramble around trying to find their one opening to escape. Yeah, he was building an enclosed freezer to electrocute people in. He was gonna pile people on top of each other. People were almost guaranteed to be injured. He had built this with his own hands, so it probably, in my opinion, for what I can see, wasn't being supervised by like actual contractors who knew what they were doing. So when the city told him that he couldn't be doing any of this, Russ took everything into his own hands. At first, Russ made this video and said that he had to tone things down a bit. We're gonna go ahead and tone things back quite a bit. It's obvious that it's just way too much. And a lot of folks want to keep it this crazy extreme haunt. And it's still going to be edgy, but we're just going to take it way, way back. I'm not sure what changes were made at this time, but they clearly didn't stay this way for long. Literally a few days after this video was posted, these people showed up at McKamey Manor for their tour, and they quit 15 minutes in. Your guys are insane. They're insane. My face has been smashed against walls. I didn't come here to be... Yeah, that's... Beaten. I can't do it. I'm sorry. I can't, I can't do Rosie. it. I can't do it. Well, well. <laughs> Look where you're at now. Well, Look what you well, did. Well. Shut up. Russ, I can't. Please, Russ, please. I want out. Please. Is this supposed to be toned down and fun, Russ? I think what happened here is that Russ got the wind pulled out of his sails. He had just wasted six months building something that went nowhere. And now he either had to rebuild in his backyard again, or he could just start scorching people. Scorching, that's the word that I'm going to be using in replacement for another word that rhymes with scorcher, but normally starts with a T. You see, you see what I'm saying here? Scorcher, I'm trying to keep my monetization, please. <laughs> Please. This is also really when the false advertising starts because up until this point, what they saw on YouTube and Travel Channel was a legitimate haunted house attraction. According to the guy in this video, that's not what they got at all. And you can tell this dude is pissed. They came all the way from England to get the experience that was advertised, but instead they were just physically harmed. And in my eyes, this is the point where McKamey Manor is no longer a haunted house. It's actually terrible because news outlets everywhere at this point were covering McKamey Manor while using footage like this. While this is footage from what McKamey Manor used to be, it's not representative of what the manor had become at this time. It was almost free advertising for Russ that depicted a fun, extreme haunted house, but when participants got there, it was not what was advertised to them at all. Instead, it had turned into Russ's puppet show where he was able to live out his most sadistic fantasies on other human beings. You are abusing people, violating their human rights, and you are creating a health and safety violation of the highest order. And you're doing so in an unbelievably deceptive way. The footage in the article that I put in this video is from two years ago. It is not representative whatsoever of how this place runs now. Whenever this place comes up in the news, and it's come up in the news twice, he would rather display it as how it used to be as opposed to how it is. I don't think that anyone who signs up for it is fully aware that that is what they're going to go through and you can seriously injure someone. Up until this point, McKamey Manor was just a backyard neighborhood attraction where Russ literally had miners working for him as actors. In the Haunters documentary, Russ and Carol explain why they had to let the kid actors go. At first, it was just hard to reel the kids in. Allegedly, one actor had one of their teachers go through the haunt and that student shoved their teacher's face into a can of dog poop or something. While that sounds like a good enough reason in and of itself to not have child actors in there anymore, it actually gets much worse. One of our actors, was um, doing some inappropriate things, you know, with minors and stuff. He was sending explicit videos and photos and everything else you can imagine. We found out that he was giving drugs and alcohol to our underage female actor back here. At the same time, the, the people that wanted to be actors were more military. And he was part of like all the skinhead stuff and all that junk, you know? But he told me, he came clean and told me, he's been, he was in jail like a whole lot of times. So I'm cool with that. The other tattooed guy out, he's got a felon too, hitting a cop. So to recap, 
Russ basically replaced his child actors with real life felons, which by the way, these are people who volunteer to do this. Yeah, he does not pay them with money. He like feeds them, I guess, but that's about it. And they all do this because they admit that they want to hurt people. What could possibly go wrong? Well, I was obviously being facetious there, but things did go wrong. One of the manor's most famous contestants, Lori Brotherton, spoke out against the manor and shared her experience. Here's some highlights from her time. Russ is by far one of the most manip manipulative men, um, even human being that I've ever come across. There's like a part of me that I hope that I will recover from, but inside of me and in my soul, I don't think I ever will um, unless I see Russ McKamey, um in prison for the rest of his life. And I'd also like to see um, the actor that did this to me also uh, pay the penalty of, of what they did. They should have known when enough was enough, but they didn't. They just kept hitting me beating me, cow prodding me, tasering me, waterboarding me, punching me in my face over and over and over again. I was scalped. I mean, uh, the things that happened to me inside there, I don't know if there's a person out there that could survive from that unless you were in the military and you were in the war. I was legitimately tortured. I'm not gonna be quiet anymore. I was quiet for a long time and I'm done. I don't want revenge, I just want justice. It's not a haunt. It's personal to Ross, and that's all it is. It's all personal. He likes to see people in pain. That's what he likes. Yes, I did really drink my own pee. Uh, inside the van, yes. This woman, Gabs on YouTube, also took a tour through McKamey Manor during this time. She says that Russ essentially used her as a guinea pig during this transitional period. And it wasn't even like, live your own scary movie. It was just like, unnecessarily rough stuff. Like. I would be walking and all of a sudden I have my face slammed against the wall. Like I left there with a gash in my forehead. I had a headache for days. Like I left bruised. Like I was covered yeah. in bruises. My body hurt like from my haunted house. And then it got worse after me. Another popular story that we hear talked about in the McKamey Manor universe is the time that Russ chained someone to a truck and dragged them behind it through gravel. He uh, drugged my cousin behind his truck until he had, he, my cousin was laid out bedridden for two weeks after being drugged by a truck from Russ. Not drugged, but dragged. What was he dragged by? Was he just pulled by people or what, what, what was he? It was a chain. Well, the, it was a chain attached to a truck. Oh, damn. Through gravel and his entire upper torso was a scab. It was missing skin, his entire upper torso. Would anyone expect to be dragged through gravel if you went to a haunt or an, even a, an extreme terror experience? I don't think so. I don't think there's any way to safely simulate dragging someone uh, until their flesh comes it off. It wasn't a simulation, it was the real thing. And it's different if you grab some by their ankles and drag them, you know, across the driveway to where you're at a human speed of two miles an hour maybe versus 30 miles an hour which i don't know how fast they were going but it was fast enough to hurt him that's a serious message if nothing else from russ to anyone that, who would ever go to mckinney manor that's true but the people who follow russ are not reasonable people they are completely captivated and have uh zero critical thinking skills and are completely consumed by the confirmation bias and for whatever reason it's like they're plugged into the matrix man i've i've really never seen anything quite like it it's absolutely no wonder that mckamey manor began to catch so much heat at this time i know i've hinted enough during this video that mckamey manor is fake and that it isn't real just know that at the time that these people that we're covering right now had their tours, it was real. It was being falsely advertised, but the stuff that was happening to them was actually happening to them when they took their tours of the manor. Russ made it clear in this video that he doesn't take well to criticism, and at this point, he was receiving a lot of it. D'Angelo Wallace, a big YouTuber, snuck into your group and states that you send out fans of yours to go and attack people who speak out against yeah. you, aka LICs. Right. Uh, true. Is this true? true? That's true, yeah. So when we, you know, we track them down, we, uh, if we find an LIC and if we find out where they're at, yeah. In fact, I mean, so you terrific. know, the biggest- So terroristic threatening and doxing. Oh, I mean, you know, we're not doxing, but we go out there, we get them. 
we get them. And if you pay attention, you have heard from those people after we get a hold of them. So you need to ask yourself, what exactly are we doing where these people are like being silenced forever? So yeah, we're real good at silencing people. Absolutely. If you badmouth this place, if I hear you online badmouth McKinney Manor, we're coming for you, all of you. You understand it? All of us are coming for all of you. Do you understand it? Yes, sir. Is Russ or any of his flying monkeys <laughs> threatening you when you speak out? They used to. That's why no one spoke out is because the flying monkeys, like Russ, would send people to just like attack to like where you didn't even want to say anything because you just like didn't want to deal with the drama. So what would what would the drama consist of? I guess like what would it be like? Literally harassment on Facebook. Oh, okay. like he just would like have, just commenting. Like yeah, like he would have people just like blow your like stuff like your pictures commenting on your pictures commenting on your posts like reporting your posts like just like any type of harassment they could do through facebook you okay. would like encourage okay so it was like mostly fake basically, basically just like stick up for me on facebook yeah so this is when he started posting exit interviews the problem is that allegedly these interviews aren't honest hey we're gonna start posting some post testimonials these are from folks who have actually gone through the tour because as a lot of you know there is so much hate really gets on my nerves this is for all you haters out there and hopefully this is going to clear up some of this nonsense because it's disgusting i mean i really kind of feel sorry for them it's like they have nothing else to do i'm glad we can be your hobby i guess but find something else man go out there and get a life in this interview with Lori Brotherton, she explains how Russ threatened her before she turned on the camera for her exit interview. In my exit video that when I did it, before Russ put the cameras on, Russ did threaten me and tell me that I needed to, to say all these amazing things about McKinney Manor. Russ did threaten me um, a $50,000 that if I didn't say great things about McKinney Manor and uh, my tour, that yeah, he'd sue me. He made me lie on my exit video saying that uh, what happened to me was exhilarating and and it was great and blah, blah, blah. This story has been corroborated by this woman interviewed by YouTuber Reckless Ben, who says this about her experience. Why did I do this? Dude, you fucked up my life. Getting my head shaved really sucked. That like fucked with my self image. I, I saw a video of you online saying uh, you're like, I'm so happy that I have short hair. I think every woman should do this. I've always kind of wanted to shave my head. This feels so great. It's so cool. Well, he asked me to and like just kind of scripted out. I found a video of her right after leaving McKamey Manor. She's very clearly shaken up kind of in a state of shock and confusion, if I had to guess, just by looking at her. And Russ relied on this while he was filming these exit interviews. I'll have you know that I found footage from her tour and it was so disturbing that I couldn't even sit through it. And I think what makes it so disturbing to me is knowing that these people didn't sign up for this. They thought they were getting something else. And then they walk into a scorcher chamber like this wasn't it this is not what they had originally intended to have happen to them and that's what disturbs me the most afterwards russ also allegedly forced her to do more exit interviews to promote a new show that he had coming up i annoyingly insisted on doing mckinney manor actually he even started posting compilations to his youtube channel of people that he called his haters which these were really just compilations of people who had very valid criticism of russ and what he was doing at the time like for a little while there russ became obsessed with quote unquote exposing his haters and his youtube channel was nothing but him acting like a tough guy reposting hours and hours of content made by other people discussing mckinney KB Manor. He doesn't really do anything to debunk any of these claims. From what I can gather, it's just Russ showcasing content that other people made and then saying, well, he's a liar and a hater. <laughs> anyway, here's another video made by another hater. Like, what are you doing? And while Russ liked to pretend that none of this criticism bothered him at all, and he was just trying to come off like, oh, they're just haters, I don't care, haters make me famous. <laughs> I think any of us with an ounce of social awareness and like understanding of human behavior can see these attempts for what they were. I would bet money on the idea that Russ was just seething over this criticism that he was getting. And this was a thinly veiled attempt for him 
him to have the upper hand against all the haters, all the people that didn't agree with him. <laughs> I'll show them I'm so much stronger. Yeah, okay, Russ. He just looks like a fragile and sad excuse for a man, in my opinion. At this point, Russ had a pretty dedicated fan base, so when he started labeling people as haters, his audience pounced and Russ allegedly sat back and reveled in it. He was now controlling an angry online mob who would defend him without thought or question. Many of you know that I've already done a video on this McCamey Manor subject. You might have also noticed that video is no longer up on my Facebook fan page. I could lie to you and say that I simply took it down because I felt like it for no real reason, but unlike the people who run McCamey Manor, I don't feel like actually deceiving you all right to your faces. The real reason I took that video down is, shortly after I put it up, my Facebook's fan page's inbox got hit with over 400 different items of hate mail and death threats. At that point, then he started getting people to go and attack and troll these people online. If anybody said anything negative about him or the haunt after they would go through. I mean, it's weird. It's like a cult. He would go and put something out online in the groups and say, oh, this person is now our enemy. All these people in these groups would start going and threatening these people and attacking them and, you know, trolling them. The mind manipulation is absolutely real. Like he, he definitely puts out orders. Anyway, for the sake of keeping monetization on this video, I'm not gonna show you pretty much any footage from this period in time because that footage from these haunts that he was still calling them, still to this day still calls them haunts. Anyway, it's disturbing. But you can watch all of them if you want to in full on YouTube. I'll have his channels linked down below if you want to go watch them. Just know he's straight up scorching people and many, many people people were injured during this time period. There are pictures of these injuries online. Reckless Ben in his YouTube videos about McCamey Manor contain some of those pictures so you can see all that there. I'm just not gonna do that to you here. But yeah, you can find medical records of all these people like from the day after they had their McCamey Manor tour and a lot of them have like broken bones in their faces and lacerations and burns and stuff. One Yelp review claims their friend was asphyxiated to the point where they lost consciousness and the actors and Russ had to stop the tour because they straight up thought they had killed him. Again, the videos from these tours are extremely disturbing and very difficult to watch. So if you're going to go off and watch those videos after you finish this video here, don't say I didn't warn you. One thing I want to bring up is that this is the time period where Russ starts to make claims that he live streams the real tour to a group of people in Vegas who then place bets and pay to have the crew do things to the contestants. The hot is being streamed live to a certain area and these folks are talking to us and they're giving us directions on what area, what zone they want to have the folks go to, what challenges they want to see happen. They're all watching you in Las Vegas right now. Apologize to Vegas. I'm sorry. You say it. I'm sorry I wasted your time, you Vegas. Apologize to Las Vegas now. Say it. I'm sorry, Vegas. I'm sorry I wasted your time. Remember this because we'll talk about this later on. As if things seemingly couldn't get any worse. Well, they did because allegedly Russ got ran out of California. Again, thanks and credit for this interview go to Reckless Ben. But this woman named Christina tells us how that all went down. She basically says when Russ started changing things up for the worse, she contacted the city of San Diego and basically narked on Russ, saying that he wasn't allowed to be running the kind of business that he was out of a residential area in San Diego. And when that wasn't enough to stop him, and Russ had exhausted all of the loopholes he had, she had allegedly convinced all of Russ's actors to quit. So my understanding is that the actors that Russ had at this time had been with him while McCamey Manor was still a legitimate haunt. And things had progressed to turn McCamey Manor into a house of scorcher. Things were teetering on the side of illegal and the gray area was shrinking. So this woman convinced all of his actors to quit because things had gone so far and she knew that some of the victims were looking to press charges. And since the actors were allegedly the ones physically making contact with the contestants, they could be held liable. Russ was essentially Charles Manson in this scenario. He was not the one to actually be hurting people. He would just be kind of giving commands and telling his actors what to do. And then he would 
would just film them doing it. So she basically told them that they needed to get out before they got in trouble. So here you have Russ. <laughs> the city of San Diego says he can't operate in their city anymore, and now he no longer has actors. Oh, also, remember his partner Carol? Yeah, he cheated on her with another woman, kicked Carol out of the house, and said that he was going to begin a new life with this new woman. That's a whole other mess of drama. We'll talk about that later in the video because it's also fascinating and infuriating. Russ's love life is unfreaking believable, but we'll get to that. Anyway, yeah, run out of California, no actors, a dissolved 15 year long relationship. The only logical next step for Russ was to move, and that's exactly what he did. Hey everybody, it's Russ coming at you right here from my backyard. No, not really, but from McCamey Manor at the new homestead, or at least the location of Tennessee. So apparently this new Tennessee location as depicted in this video wasn't utilized in the haunts for very long. It's kind of hard to put all these pieces of information together, but Russ was talking about moving the haunt to Huntsville, Alabama. But as far as I could tell, McCamey Manor never operated out of Alabama. Only San Diego and Tennessee. Anyway, according to this screenshot that I found on the McCamey Manor exposed YouTube channel, he only used it a handful of times and the owner started getting hate messages and was like, you have to stop. There are a few lives out there on the property. One, he's driving a truck and the girls are helping him move stuff, but the guy died during the pandemic and Russ is still friends with his adult kids. I'm not sure how close it is to Huntsville, but I know 100% there was never a Huntsville location that he owned. I also just think it's interesting to include Russ trying to manipulate his side of the story regarding all this, making it out like he's the victim and no one understands him and everyone's just a hater. You know, we've gotten everything from a massive amount of death threats. This isn't just a few comments, this is a lot of comments. So keep an eye on me. If uh, I magically disappear, I'm kinda ready for that. I don't need to have a whole bunch of actors behind me yelling and screaming and getting tough and shoving people around. I've done all that and I got a lot of complaints. People said, man, he's taking it too personal. But we have a lot of opposition out here in the south. And if you've ever been into the McCamey Manor lore, like if you've ever heard of McCamey Manor before, you've certainly heard that Russ in the past has offered a cash prize to anyone who can complete the manor. Well, here at the new location is when he makes his first offer. He says that if anyone can make it through the first two phases, he'll give the contestant $1,000. Over time, this prize went from that to $10,000, then again to $20,000. Then in 2019, Russ took that off the table. As you know, I took the 20 grand off the table for this particular show. There's no, there's no way I'm going to offer 20 grand. And as of right now, I'm pretty sure that the $20,000 prize is back on the table. And I've heard that through the grapevine because Russ knew that no one was coming to the manor anymore. So he needed to put the offer back on the table, I guess. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. Now that we know the history of the manor itself, before I move on to what's going on with it today, we need to address Russ himself. I hate that I have to do this. I hate that I have to put us through this, but we are going to talk about Russ and his personal relationships. You may be like, how is that even relevant? Well, I mean, it kind of is because I think that it explains a lot. Just so you all know, we're gonna be talking about Russ's own children, their personal accounts of their childhood, including the way he allegedly traumatized and manipulated them as kids, also mental illness. I'm censoring myself here, obviously, for the sake of monetization, but if you put two and two together, you'll know what I'm talking about. Yeah, those are some of the topics we're going to be covering in this portion here, so just practice proper discretion. Many people who have previously been close to Russ have spoken out against him, including his daughter, Lindsay, who at the time of this interview had gone no contact with Russ for 10 years. Russ actually has two grown biological children that I know of. His oldest son, Russell, has not provided any statements against Russ from what I could find, but this interview with Lindsay is pretty telling. She and Russell have different moms, so they are half siblings, just so we're aware. According to Lindsay, Russ had a rough childhood because his dad had taken his own life when Russ was a teenager. Russ served in the Navy for 22 years, so these two experiences mixed probably with 
plenty of more stuff, obviously made things difficult for Russ. Not surprisingly, he was later diagnosed with OCD and bipolar disorder by a doctor, and he is well aware of his mental illness. Kind of goes without saying though, right? Russ clearly takes McKamey Manor to a level farther than I think most people would. His mind does not work like most people's minds. All you have to do is watch one of Russ's movies, as he calls them, and the first thing that's gonna pop into your mind is, oh yeah, this dude is not okay <laughs> at all. Lindsay says that Russ was mentally and psychologically towards her between the ages of 6 and 13, which 13 is when she finally decided to not be in contact with him anymore. He has hurt a lot of people, including me. I mean, I've been in therapy my whole life. I have panic disorder. I have panic attacks every single day. I have to take medicine every day for my panic attacks. I mean, I am royally fucked up because of this man. <laughs> I have to find the human in him or I'll go crazy. I have to empathize with him because... I, I ha I'm half of him. I can hate him all I want. I can say he's a psychopath all I want, but the truth of the matter is, is he's ill. He is abusive. He is verbally, psychologically, he puts you in a ground, in the ground and treats you less than dirt. That is true. And he did that to me when I was six years old until the day that I left. That is true. She's almost apologetic for Russ in this interview, saying he's not a bad guy, he's just sick, and he's never received help for his illness. Of course, I don't know Russ at all, and this is his daughter, but I still think that she has some reflecting to do on who her father is. From what I've seen of Russ, I think he's a monster. I think he's far past the point of help. I believe her when she says that Russ is a narcissist, and it can be very hard for narcissistic people to admit guilt of anything or admit that they've done anything wrong, so it all adds up. Lindsay says she was constantly manipulated and traumatized by Russ as a child. She gives examples how he used unaliving as a way to convince people in his life not to leave him, which is obviously extremely manipulative. He attempted to commit suicide in front of me to get me to stay, um, which he also did to Carol many times um, and to my mom. Um, it's a tactic he uses to get people to stay. Lindsay says that as a child, Russ would put her through McKamey Manor, obviously before it turned into a scorcher chamber, but she says he did it to teach her to be mentally strong because he was not. Instead, this only further traumatized her and contributed to her developing a panic disorder. When I was younger and my dad would practice on me was, you know, mind over matter because he wanted me to be mentally strong because he is not. Okay. So he would put me through things, um, put me in the haunt, do certain things to me to trick me, trick my brain, which was very traumatic. Her story is very sad. And what's even more sad to me is that she clearly hasn't worked through all of it yet. She has a lot of trauma there and that's very clear because of the way she's defending Russ a little bit. I'll admit it's probably a very difficult situation for her to be in and I don't blame her for not dealing with it the way that anyone on the outside thinks she should. So yeah, I can't blame her for any of that. So Russ was apparently married to Lindsay's mother. After their divorce, Russ began a relationship with this woman that I showed briefly earlier, Carol. According to her, her relationship with Russ lasted 15 years. She's featured pretty heavily in the Haunters documentary, and she says she met him when they were 17. The documentary makes it sound like they were high school sweethearts and got married and had this long romantic relationship together, but we know that he had multiple relationships before he and Carol began theirs. In regards to her life with Russ later on, she says McKamey Manor started out fun, but Russ took it too far, presumably after the Hazy Meadows operation was shut down. She says he's not the person that he used to be. You know, he is not the same person that I that I used to know. I, I mean, I've known him since 1977. You know, when I first started going out with him and moved in with him, you know, he was a really nice guy and things just slowly started to change. And Carol actually stayed around a little longer through this. She appears at the end of this video, which was one of the last manor tours he did in California, which was an extremely scorchery one. To me though, it seems like she's kind of just putting on a brave face. I can tell she looks uncomfortable with what Russ is doing. You know, he's telling me stuff like, oh, you're fat, who would ever want to be with you? You know, and just, stuff like that it's just every day something derogatory and negative and he told me at one point that the 
Oh, he's always been infatuated with bodybuilders, female bodybuilders. The, and the bigger that they are, the better it is. So he told me that the only way he would marry me is if I was a bodybuilder. He wanted me to be at the gym all the time. Well, he wasn't going to the gym. I'm like, fuck, he's like nine months pregnant. I'm working full time. I'm commuting three hours a day. I'm running his DJ business. I'm working on the hunt. I'm cooking his meals. I'm cleaning. I'm taking care of nine to 13 dogs at a time. I'm not going to go to the gym. He would be really angry with me if I didn't work on the hunt said I wasn't passionate enough about it and stuff but you know like I said if if I'm working eight hours a day commuting three hours a day grocery shopping taking care of dogs running his business with his brides dealing with all of them and doing the bridal timelines and all that the last thing I want to do is go out in the backyard and work on the hunt and he would be pissed you know because I'm like trying to get by on four or five hours of sleep maybe maximum but he would be upset. I was constantly telling him he couldn't do things. Like he, at one point he wanted to cover people's faces with saran wrap. And I mean, it's pretty obvious you can't do that. But, uh, he, you know, he would fight me on, on everything, constantly fight me on everything. It had to be his way or no way. He's extremely unhygienic. He wouldn't shower for a week. He wouldn't get off the couch for a week. He doesn't brush his teeth. It, it, he's just disgusting. I would come home and I'm like, you've got to take a shower. You reek. You just, you're, you stinky ass, man. So not only was Russ just being a nasty human, both in stench and personality <laughs> to Carol, during this time. He also cheat. Oh, hi, kitty, peepee kitty, hi. He also cheated on her and tried to make people believe that they weren't even romantically involved. The crazy ass women that would call our house and, you know, photos and constant Skyping 24 hours a day. And it didn't matter if they were 17 or 70. He didn't care. His insanity, it, it just made no sense. It makes no sense to anyone. I don't know how he, he could think that that was okay and he keeps saying that he wasn't in a relationship with me. And I mean, what pure bullshit is that? I mean, I don't pay the bills for somebody because I'm not involved with him. She started Skyping with him and like by the end of the first or second day, they were in love and he would constantly Skype her. I mean, they had phone conversations that were keeping me up. I had to go to work and they were keeping me up all night and I was getting madder and madder because he had absolutely no consideration for my job. The person paying his bills, it was like an $800 phone bill. I mean, it was insane. Well, I'm working to support him. He's on the phone with her and other women too, but with her. Carol and Russ were together for 15 freaking years. Lindsay calls her her stepmom. They own the house together in San Diego. They had a life together, so this was a long-term serious relationship. After their split, Carol came out to tell her side of the story, which is the interview where I'm getting most of these clips from. So I think we can all take a moment to appreciate Carol for unmasking Russ the way that she has here. He really tried to paint her as this evil woman when really Russ allegedly took everything from her. Most of my money uh, went into the haunt, not just the haunt, went into paying the house and paying everything, paying all the bills and, and everything. Russ didn't work for the last three years that we were together. He calls me the thief and he calls me all this stuff, but I was supporting him while he was home fooling around. When I left and I took props, I felt I deserved to do that because I had paid for a lot of stuff. I can't stand him. He took uh, he took a hundred thousand dollars from me on the promise that he would pay it back and he's never done it. He when I asked for it, I wanted to leave before I did because I just I couldn't handle all the things that he was doing on Skyping and with all the women and I mean 
such inappropriate stuff. And I would ask for my money so that I could leave. And he would just say, prove it. Prove that you gave the money. He always says that I held him hostage, but he was holding me hostage because he had all of my money and all of his money. And I paid off his second mortgage for him, which was $100,000, on the promise that he would pay me back. I've never seen a dime of it. He sold that house. You know, I lived there 15 years. I made mortgage payments. I paid his lawyer bills. I paid his credit card bills. And he's never offered to pay me a cent. I don't have it. He has all of my money. I have no savings or anything. Before he got fired, we had talked about putting all of the 401k money into his account because it was a better option than my account. And so my money went to the bills, you know, a good chunk of his money went into his 401k. Last, when I left, he had over $400,000 in his 401k and I have zero. For paying bills for 15 years or helping him pay bills, I feel I was entitled to half of the proceeds of the sale, but I got none of that either. So I got nothing, nothing from him. After he got fired, he refused to work. I mean, I don't, hey, you know, why don't you go quit your job or why don't you go get fired and I'll support you. And then, hey, here's an idea. I've known Holly for two days and I love her and she loves me. I'm gonna have her move into the house with us, the three of us, and she can cook you dinner. I don't think so. I don't think so. I'm not gonna support her. I'm not gonna support him and it, it, that was that was the end of it. So Carol is a paralegal. And from what I was able to dig up, it's not like they make a butt ton of money. And Russ was a freaking wedding singer and then was eventually unemployed. So Carol was allegedly paying for everything, minus what Russ was getting from his time in the military, I guess. It seems to me like Carol was entitled to keeping everything that she did. Like those props and animatronics are expensive. Have you ever been to a spirit Halloween store? I think Carol deserved to keep it all. Maybe she was able to make some of her money back by selling some of the pieces. I hope so. So hearing Carol talk about this new woman, Holly, it's easy to jump to the conclusion that she was some kind of a homewrecker. Well, actually, Holly came forward about Russ before Carol even did. So this is Holly. Yeah, I know what every single one of you are thinking right now. She's young and she's hot. How the hell did Russ land someone like her? We'll get to it, but Russ eventually falls into a cycle with women like Holly, which really speaks on how Russ comes off as very charismatic at first. And and then he can manipulate just about anyone into doing his bidding. Holly started out as a contestant of the manor, and once the relationship started, it appears as though Russ forced her to go through the tour multiple times. So I'm gonna include some highlights from Holly's statement here. Just know that the audio quality is a little bit poopy, and whoever posted it would occasionally do some weird little audio effects and stupid background music and stuff. So if you hear any of that, just know that I didn't do that. But anyway, okay, here's Holly. What I'm about to tell you is going to, it's going to change what, what you may think of, uh, of Russ and how, uh, how you view him. It's, it's going to change everything. He was very uh, protective over me, very controlling, very protective. All of it was the front. When the camera goes off, I saw the real, the real Russ. He has a weapon and he threatened violence against me. He said that he saw himself shooting me with his gun and I was like, oh shit. I was like, I got to get out of here. That was back in Tennessee. But um, I'm not justifying what he does, but he's, um, he needs to get help. He needs to be locked away in a loony bin. He does. He would choke me out all the time um, to build up my neck or whatever. But that's a felon to choke people. It's a felon. Um, he had, he would bite me. He had he would bite hard on me. He left my back with bruises. He did deprive me of food. I, I mean, I, would, I remember times I would beg. I'm like, I, can we please go into town and get food? I don't have a vehicle. And so I, I walked to uh, the town to get food, and I would carry a big backpack because he wouldn't get off his lazy ass to go get food. And there was a time where I would just eat ice in the freezer because there was no there was dog food. There was plenty of dog food, but nothing for me and uh, to eat. And there was food, um, and there was times where he wouldn't eat. It was weird, and so he would. That was a way to control. I'll control you. I'll just, I'll just starve you. Uh, when, when Rocky died, 
on my birthday, the dog was dying of cancer, and it was my birthday um, the very next day. Well, that night, uh, I was sleeping next to the dog, um, sleeping bags, and he did something so creepy. I mean, it was creepy. Uh, he went and sang happy birthday to me while I was sleeping next to a dying dog. But this was so sick. The very next day when, when, when we had to put Rocky down, you, you didn't have to put him down right away. You could... You could have just uh, kept him making him feel comfortable, but he knew that, well, since it's a birthday, I'm going to really make her remember a birthday. And so we took the dog to the vet, and they said, look, we have to put him down because he's dying. And I understand to end the dog's suffering. I was crying. I was in tears. You know, like I've never been next to a dog that was going to sleep. I didn't want to see that, but he's all, no, you're going to see this because I don't want Rocky to die alone. Because if, if he goes alone then that just shows the guilt the his favorite weapon of modality is guilt so he made me told me to pick up rocky's face while the dog was dying after he just got injected and he started taking pictures of me holding the dying dog when i was bawling i was crying and he was just filming and taking pictures and his damn crocodile tears whatever i don't believe when he cries and so he was just taking pictures of the emotion like he was trying to capture that energy he's such a sick fuck like oh my god he is so effing sick and i i pray for the day that he's hauled away in a loony bin i pray for that day i he's so he would do the same with carol he would make carol hold the dying dog and take pictures because he liked that emotion and he's such a fucking sick hollywood wannabe director jackal oh my god oh my god like i was so brainwashed. I mean, I, I feel like a new woman. I'm like, oh my God, he had weapons in the house and he would threaten me. So I called the cops and I'm like, listen, this guy's trying to, he, he's hurt. He's trying to kill me. He threatened me with a gun. I need you to come and find me. I wish that I would have just kept on running and argued out and they could, and the cops would be there. Then they would have seen Russ and I would say, hey, help me. He's crazy. He's trying to kill me. They would have hauled him out. He was really missing me, and he was sending me, like, texts of how much he loves me and how much he wants me to be his little bodybuilder. So I figured, okay, Russ, I'll meet you in Vegas. Let's go to Las Vegas. We'll go to Las Vegas. And what he wanted to do was he wanted to marry me and spend over $10,000. The very, while he was, uh, it was the very day I was supposed to be at the airport, he called to see if I was at the airport. And I told him, no, Russ, I'm not. I decided not to. And he went ballistic. He screamed and screamed, and he he said, I can't get that money back. How could you do this? And I guess I did it because I just wanted my soul to feel good because I just like, there, now how do you like it? Now, like, when I first met him, I was like, I was like, oh, this is a nice person. Oh, you're tortured by Carol. Oh, you poor baby. Let me help you. But you know what? And I had I had to go into my own self and realize, oh, my God. I'm just trying to help him in order to help me out. Because I was hurt. So I'm like, no, this person is truly sick. It's time to go. The real McKamey Manor, the real, the real horror is what that man did to people that he supposedly loved. I'll admit that the way that she talks about the situation sounds a little unhinged, and in my opinion, her tone sounds very exaggeratory, if that's a word. Is that a word? We're going with it. <laughs> That all aside, I still believe her. After hearing Carol's experience and knowing how hard the fallout of that time probably had a negative effect on Russ, yeah, it's all believable. And Holly was clearly traumatized too, so I guess I can't blame her for sounding a little eccentric. Well, Savannah, you can't just take two women's word as truth. Okay, I'll take that criticism and raise you one more. This is Susan. Yep another gorgeous young woman who had a relationship with Russ and came forward to tell her story. And what is so fascinating to me about Susan particularly is that when I made my original McKamey Manor video four years ago, I featured a live that Russ posted in the private Facebook group of a tour he was doing with Susan. Little did I know that during this time, there was a budding romance between the two of them. Yeah, Susan started out as a contestant with McKamey Manor, just like Holly. But Russ's manipulation would have lasting effects on Susan long after her initial tour ended. I'm making this statement out of concern and a sense of moral obligation for anyone dealing with Russ or individuals like him. 
Sadly, I think he's trapped in a victim mindset and he's incapable of remorse and also recognizing the damage of some of his actions and words. I don't want to focus too much on McKinney Manor because that's not the purpose of my statement here. It's simply the medium through which the relationship between Russ and myself began. And only a month after meeting, we were very much infatuated with each other. I thought I was falling in love. He claimed to be in love. I was making an effort to see him every other weekend when I did not have my son. He was extremely charming, very charismatic. I would even describe him as being chivalrous in the, in the beginning. And I definitely didn't care about our age difference. I've always been one to believe that love is about the hearts that are involved. He, he would do things like, ask me to marry him and then tell me just to say yes to play along and at first I thought things like that were very endearing. I'm a vegetarian. One time we were at a buffet and he told me I had to eat a bite of meat or he would turn into sand, which is bizarre, but I refused and told him I felt he was disrespecting my lifestyle and he started crying saying I did not love him. He made me pick his teeth with my nails in a public parking lot and got angry when I went to wash my hands afterwards and he on many occasions wanted to chew food and make me eat it from his mouth. I did not want to, and I never did this, but every time he got upset at me for it. Uh, during manner activities and stunts, if there was something I did not want to do, he would tell me that if I did not do it, that I did not love him or trust him. I also need to make it clear that there were times I was really overwhelmed with conversations and interactions with him that I wouldn't return his calls for two to three days at a time and he would message me incessantly, make it seem like it was my fault for not talking. And then when we did resume conversations, I was the one apologizing to him, made to feel like I was the one that had abandoned him. So lots of drama unfurled between September 2019 to the end of November 2019, where our relationship disintegrated essentially. Russ came to visit me early November 2019. Quite frankly, during this visit, it was the worst I'd experienced from him. And I'm gonna be blunt. Sorry, he was rougher than he'd ever been with me, leaving clear marks and bruises. He was also calling his other girlfriend daily while he was with me at my place, and I was supposed to say it was okay. Unfortunately, I don't think that Russ knows how to take responsibility. In his world, in his mind, he is always the victim. Instead of being honest with his doctors, Russ was taking out his worst, most nightmarish, dreadful thoughts on me. And I know I am not the only one that he's done this to. Now I have unfortunately saved the absolute worst of the worst part for last. There is one thing that these three women have in common with their statements, and that is the accusation regarding Russ having impure thoughts and fantasies about young people. I'm obviously gonna censor the worst parts and the worst words in these audio clips here. I'm not gonna go into detail, but we all know what these statements are suggesting. And we need to believe these women. This is not some organized smear campaign to paint Russ out to be a P word. This is real life dangerous shit. I believe these women and I wholeheartedly believe that Russ is a disgusting monster. And that's putting it mildly. I can't say the things that I want to say here on this platform because Hi, YouTube. But there is one thing that I can say, and that is, fuck Russ McCamey. I told the police officer, listen, you need to watch this man. There are children in Summertown, and you need to keep an eye on him because he goes after children. He looks at children in a sexual manner. He's a predator. And if you, that's why Russ is so crazy about protecting kids, because deep down, I know his dirty secret. Yeah, he fantasizes about kids and whatever woman is in his clutches, he's going to tell his dirty fantasies to. You know, he would have these dreams about young boys, young girls, and he would wake me up and say, please tell me it doesn't mean anything. And just, you know, every, it's exhausting. Every, like every day, every day. It was more than you can handle and I just kept looking for a way out. There's no way out from crazy. Sometimes he would tell me that he had inappropriate thoughts about kids and he couldn't help it. He would ask me to tell him that it was okay or that nothing means nothing. His descriptions at first were really vague and then slowly as time went by became much more explicit. And in August of 2019 is when he started to talk about some of these thoughts 
involving my son. Tell me it's okay. Tell me nothing means nothing. The first few times this happened, I was taken aback, but I had also been to the VA with him and spoken with his doctor to better understand his mental illness. Uh, the first time we went to the VA together, Russ specifically asked me not to talk about any of the thoughts he had about kids or my son because he was sure that they would put him away. Out of what I thought was love and understanding, I obliged at the time. When I was doing the haunt with him, they, he would tell me his sick fantasies that he has with kids, with children. He's a passive pedophile. Now, when I say passive pedophile, meaning he would go to Walmart while I was there shopping and he would just be looking at kids, looking at kids in like um, in dresses and skirts, it's girls, boys, teenagers. He, okay, the real authentic truth about Russ is that he fantasizes about children and he likes to torment people. He kept talking about sexual fantasies about kids. I was supposed to say it was okay. My son came up in these fantasies time and time again, and I was supposed to say it was okay. One of the nights he was with me, we were supposed to go to dinner with my son together. And I realized in that moment, I couldn't stand the idea of him meeting my son and looking at him with all the things that he'd said over and over, asking for my reassurance every time. I went to dinner with my son and left Russ behind at my apartment. I think it's then I finally realized how fucked up all of this was, and I could never let Russ be a father figure to my child. It's one thing to have mental illness and have disturbing thoughts, but it is entirely another to explicitly express inappropriate thoughts about children, especially to a mother, where you include her child in those statements. When I left, that was a big blow to his fragile ego. I had a good looking woman and she's gone. What am I gonna do? She was the only one that could save me from my petty thoughts. Cause he would tell me, it doesn't mean anything that I saw myself putting my hands on that little boy's butt, or it doesn't mean anything that I saw myself putting my face on that girl's you know, shit like that. And he's like, she was the only one that made it good and made it okay, but whatever. Upon a lot of concern and a lot of reflection, I realized that Rust raised my like mama bear protection radar from my own child as I realized I never wanted him around my son for the worst fear that he could do potential detriment and damage. You need to always watch Rust because the reason I came back so many times to Tennessee was I was trying to protect the kids of the neighborhood, and a lot of people don't know that. I was trying to make sure that he didn't go out and, and get too close to the kids or watch the kids in, on his porch and crazy crap like that. He'll deny it to this day, but the truth is I came back so many times to protect the children in that neighborhood from the real boogeyman. As of recently, he appears to have his grasps set on this woman, Haley, another drop-dead, gorgeous, beautiful young woman. And again, her relationship with Russ started out as a contestant in the manor. She allegedly started seeing Russ in 2019, so I wonder if this is the same person Susan says that he was texting in front of her while they were together. At this time, Haley was 24 years old. Looking through the Facebook group, Haley became very involved with the manor, and Russ by extension. She was making all of the update posts, she was going live, Russ would often use her phone to go live in the Facebook groups, and there's this video where the two of them are goofing off in the manor by themselves at night, so I think we can draw our own conclusions about what was going on between the two of them at this time. However, this screenshot dropped from the same time period where it looks like she was cheating on Russ, even though, whatever, he clearly cheats on everyone all the time. And the dude who released these screenshots appears to have had a girlfriend named Stacy at the time, Time, but I don't know the depths of that relationship and quite honestly it's irrelevant and I don't care. But I'm sure her mom has got it going on. Now they all suck in this situation. Obviously these voice notes are ones that we'll probably never hear, but I'm sure our imagination can fill in the blanks. But the chats we can see say, Do you think Russ would kill me if he found out about us, beautiful? What he doesn't know won't hurt. Make sure to delete your messages so Stacy doesn't see them, and I'll keep deleting mine before Russ has a chance of seeing anything. He would never suspect this from me. I just can't help the way I'm starting to feel about you, Garrett. But it's for the best for everybody if we 
keep this between just us for now. I don't know what happened between Haley and Russ, but her Facebook profile has this picture as her cover photo, and that's not Russ. The weird thing is, is that she's still in this Facebook group today, and she is still liking the newest posts in there to this day. Russ and his moderators are so quick to kick people out of the Facebook group. I will most likely be deemed a hater after this video and kicked out of the Facebook group. Carol, Holly, and Susan, not only do they no longer appear to be part of this group, and not only that, as a matter of fact, they've all kind of vanished from the internet without a trace. If I had to guess, I'd say it's because of the incessant bullying and harassment that they received from the cult of Russ McKamey after their relationships with Russ had dissolved and it caused them to leave the internet. That's just speculation, but it adds up in my opinion. So Haley must still be under Russ's control, just not in a romantic way, but she was doing live manor tours alone with Russ in the Facebook group as recently as January of this year. This guy makes a really good point about how he believes that Russ has been using McKamey Manor to specifically meet young vulnerable women that he could manipulate into having a relationship with him. And I think he's absolutely 100% right. And I think that he's still doing this to this day. Uh, but the reason we wanted to shut him down was because he was hurting people and manipulating people like these females. He preyed on vulnerable, emotionally distraught or emotionally fragile females, mostly what came to see him. I would say probably 90% of the girl, of the people that came to Russ McCamey's period were female. Uh, every now and then he would have a male contestant, but mo for the most part they were female. Um, and it was like he try to date them all. So we know Russ's personal bullshit, and we know how McKamey Manor came to be. So what is McKamey Manor up to today? Well, where we last left off, Russ McKamey got ran out of California. If I have the timeline of events correct, after having a falling out on the first property in Tennessee, he bought the plot of land that he operates McKamey Manor from today out in rural Tennessee. From the sounds of it, he was run off that piece of property by Christina and her group of anti-McKamey Manor activists the same way that they had run him out of San Diego, and the owner of the land kicked Russ out. Carol had kept most of Russ's animatronics and other props, so Russ basically had to start over. According to Carol, though, she left a few things for him to keep. What did I take? Well, I did not take the drowning tank. I, did, I left that behind. I don't want that nasty-ass thing. I didn't take the freezers that people peed in and vomited in that he never cleaned out. I didn't take those. I didn't take his stupid little rat maze. I didn't really take that much stuff because, you know, the thing, his little pit of dirt, because mostly the stuff that he has was so poorly taken care of. It's trash. It's broken. It's rotted. And here's the other thing. He says that I stole it all. I want to make this perfectly clear. He made at least 10 or 12 trips to this house here in South Dakota himself and with his friends and brought boatloads of stuff here, boatloads. Now this is South Dakota. It gets to 40 below. He left all of his stuff outside. It rotted. I had to have the fire department down the road come and haul it away because it was a health hazard and it was ruined, it was destroyed. I left him his clothes. <laughs> What's wild to me is this interview with Carol was posted in 2019. That's four years ago now. And all of those things that Carol says she left for Russ, well, those are some of the only things we see still being utilized by Russ today. Because today, McKamey Manor has evolved into something so disturbing, so wild, so unbelievable. It's shocking that I'm even putting it in this YouTube video. I don't think you're ready for the shocking footage of what McKamey Manor is today. So hold your breath, count to three, because here it is. See, I'm a little crab. 
Okay, yeah, I'm not kidding when I say that once Russ moved to Tennessee and lost literally everything, this is what became of McKamey Manor and what it has dissolved into to this day. Because in the past, we used to see Russ falsely advertise McKamey Manor as this extreme haunted house, but in reality, it was actually a scorcher chamber. Now it's kind of the opposite. Today, Russ claims to have an elaborate underground haunted house filled with alligators and wasps and rats. But we'll get to that. First, I want to debunk some of the many lies that Russ McKamey has told over the years. Huh, Pip. One thing I haven't brought up yet in this video is that Russ makes no money from running the manor. The only cost for admission has always been just a bag of dog food, even today. He never had people pay for his haunt. He said, oh, donate uh, dog food, which started because Carol, his partner, was very, very passionate for greyhounds. He didn't like dogs at first. Um, okay. He didn't like them because they hump things and that's dirty and that's wrong. He doesn't really like animals because they do things that are naturally instinctual for them that makes him uncomfortable. Um, but Carol came along and brought all her dogs. And I, to my knowledge, from what I could have, from what I saw, he fell in love with them. Some of them were afraid of him because he has an energy that is scary to a lot of people, especially dogs. Since Russ moved across the country, he no longer could donate the dog food he was receiving to the Greyhound Rescue that he donated to in the past. Now he makes it sound like he's just feeding it to his own dogs? Well, it used to be Greyhound Rescue in San Diego, in San Diego but now we're out here in Tennessee. And oh. Now it's just helping out a lot of homeless animals. It's, unfortunately, there's a lot of dogs out here that roam free and so we just kind of take care of, of all the dogs we can find yeah helping all the homeless dogs that he can find sounds like i adopted some dogs and then i feed them the food that people bring me which whatever i mean just be honest about it russ dog food's expensive and if you're using this dog food to just feed your own horde of dogs that you have on your property just say so regardless though yeah mckamey manor has never been making money from admission however there was one speculation that Russ was making money from this mysterious group of people that he was live streaming the tours to in Las Vegas. Tell the people right now, tell, they're watching, tell Vegas this, right now. This was entirely, look at me, look at me. Look this at is entirely camera. more than I thought it was gonna be. This won't shock you, but according to Carol, she says there's never been a Vegas betting ring live stream. There's no Vegas. You know, he's always pointing up to some camera up on the ceiling, and those are those fake battery operated cameras. There's no Vegas. There's no wire to Vegas. Nobody's going to invest in betting with him. There's nothing. This is be before it just went to strictly the van. When he actually took them through the hunt, he would say that Vegas was telling him what they wanted the contestants to do. That never happened. And I mean, come on. He said that he was live streaming to Vegas in 2014. Live streaming was in its absolute infancy then. You couldn't even go live on Facebook and Instagram until 2016. And Russ wants us to believe that he had cameras on the ceiling that were streaming the haunt to some specific place in Las Vegas? How, Russ? The dark web? Does Russ even know what the dark web is? Let alone how to stream to it? I've also read that the tour browsers that you use to access the dark web is just, it's slow as hell today in the year of our Lord 2023, let alone almost 10 years ago in 2014. Plus, the director of the documentary that heavily featured Russ called Haunters literally said Russ was the least tech savvy guy out there. I'm like still secretly like conspiracy, like he's got to be selling it to like <laughs> dark web. Like I'm totally. <laughs> I don't, he's not that savvy. His video camera at one point he was filming, it was all white. And I was like, oh dude, he's like, I got a new camera. The other one he got, <laughs> he broke the camera because it there was too much water in it, and I was like so afraid to film because I'm renting cameras. I'm like, oh my God, how do I get this uh, footage on the computer right? It's a new camera. And I was like, okay, so I would just show him because I yeah. want that footage in the movie. I want to make sure. Right. If not, I cannot believe at all for even half a second he would know how to get this on the dark web or that he knows about the dark web. Try to explain to your parents how to use Roku, okay? 
do that and then tell me if they're going to be transferring shit to the dark web. That's who we're talking about, okay? The Vegas live stream never made sense to me. Or to anyone that had a singular drop of knowledge about, like, how much bandwidth it takes to stream to a platform that's specifically designed to support streaming, let alone to the freaking dark web. <laughs> so it's validating to hear that Carol can confirm, yeah, Russ was full of shit. So let's talk about the McKamey Manor waiver that went viral. This waiver created quite a lot of publicity for the manor, claiming things like you can be expected to be drugged, or have fingernails ripped from their nail beds, or have your teeth pulled. But not surprisingly, according to Carol, that was also fake. As far as injecting anybody or all of that stuff, he basically, the drugs that he used were Tic Tacs. He'd make you take Tic Tacs. There's no injecting, there's no teeth pulling, the pliers are plastic, um, the drill bit is rubber or whatever it is. It's on a real drill, but it's foam or whatever it is. There's, there's nothing going on. The only thing that real that you see that actually does happen is the hair cutting, but the other stuff is just all pure bullshit. Russ's daughter Lindsay also corroborates the claim that at the very least the needles are fake. A lot of it is like movie magic. A lot of it is not real. So a lot of people freak out because they see the needles and the horn of the teeth and they see the blood. The needles are retractable. You're not being injected with anything. My dad is okay. of drugs. It's part of his OCD. Therefore, he would never drug someone. Um, that's why he's so against all drugs and all drinking is because he thinks he associates drinking and drugs with bad people. And so he's terrified of it. And yeah, come on. I ripped the live that I'm about to show you here from the private Facebook group. It was posted in May, 2023. And it is so obvious. I'll be desaturating the footage so no one's triggered by fake blood, but this is obviously so fake. It's laughable and I need to show it to you. So yeah, here you can see the blade, but the tip of the blade is what's making contact with the skin. So why then is the blood coming out from a place that he hasn't cut yet? And then when he's done, there's a freaking drop of blood like two inches from the cut he made. Like he clearly had one of those little fake blood capsules and was squeezing it with his finger behind the box cutter. Also, also, the blood's not pumping. She's not actively bleeding. No more blood appears when he lifts the box cutter. And then right after this, he injects her with drugs. Dude, he's practically going straight down. With the length of that needle, he'd be hitting the bone. And he pulls it out so slow, clearly, so you can't see the needle retracting. As far as his power tools, I mean, yeah. Anyone who has ever seen a chainsaw, like a real chainsaw, can see that this is a prop and it's not real. Carol says this drill head is made of foam, and that makes sense because you can see that it's hitting this girl's tongue here and literally nothing is happening. If this was a real sharp, rusty drill head, it'd be cutting her tongue up. It seems unfair to call any of this movie magic. They're all just craptacular props. More lies to address here. Now, it depends on what videos you watch, but Russ has always claimed that there's a wait list of thousands of people. The number changes depending on what you're watching. Sometimes it's 10,000, sometimes it's 17,000, sometimes it's 27,000, sometimes it's 30,000. Doesn't matter. Carol debunks all this too. We did not put $100,000 into the haunt either, like he says. I don't know where he gets his numbers. Just like his fake 27,000 people in line. He has like two people in line. He's never had a waiting list. There have been a few people trying to expose this lie over the past few years. People have made fake accounts of pretty girls to try to bait Russ into letting them into the manor immediately instead of being put on a waiting list. But this lie is made abundantly clear thanks to the expose that Reckless Ben is currently doing over on his YouTube channel. Let's see what we got going on in here. What's up? There he is, dog food in hand. He applied for McKamey Manor, which at the time allegedly had 17,000 people on the waiting list. Wow, he sure got lucky to be moved to the front of the line because he was accepted an hour later and taking his tour of the manor shortly after. But there's no way that he could get that lucky again. Oh wait, he had his friend Danny apply and he also got approved right away. Okay, but there's no way that they can do it a third to- oh look, 
Here's Ben's friend Jackson, who got in immediately. Jackson's going through McKimmy Manor. How is it that there's a waiting list of thousands of people, and Ben and his friends were all able to get in one after the other after the other? And while I was scripting this video, there's this dude Nathan, who was going live in the group and doing his tasks. I was like, I'll be damned if this guy isn't also involved with Ben, because look at him. He fits right in with the friend group. I said, I'm calling it right now. This guy is part of it. Uh, update? Yeah, Nathan was definitely a part of it. Reckless Ben can't post another McKamey Manor video to his main YouTube channel until October 15th because his channel has been hit with two strikes by YouTube because Russ sent his flying monkeys to mass report Ben's McKamey Manor series. And if he gets a third strike, YouTube will just terminate his channel. So I think one of those strikes, if not both of them for whatever reason, expire on October 15th so he can start posting again after that. Do you understand why there was a ridiculously long disclaimer at the beginning of this video now? <laughs> I'm just so interested to see what Ben has up his sleeve next because he's really getting under Russ's skin and it is hilarious to watch. Oh, he's a massive hater, man. Massive hater. Oh, yeah. Goes on, makes all these stories up. Ben, you're so full of crap. While we're talking about Ben, I'll bring up the fact that he says that the prize money doesn't exist. He's not the only one who says that. Plenty of people say that. Russ doesn't want anyone to beat the haunt, so he'll do anything that he can to make sure that you would never make it to the real manor. Because not only is there no prize money, there's no actual haunted house that you can make it to in the first place. Thankfully, Carol also corroborates this. You can't win. You can't win because... I mean, if he wants you to go an hour or 20 hours, you know, if you think you've got it beat, you don't because he'll just keep adding on to it and adding on to it. There's, you have no chance in hell of ever beating the hot, ever. Plenty of law YouTubers have covered this viral waiver, such as Leisha Miller and Legal Eagle. And I think the general consensus is the waiver wouldn't protect Russ indefinitely. Russ has fallen back on this waiver to keep his contestants quiet for years by instilling fear in them that if they speak out, they'll owe Russ $50,000. I mean, he also threatens to run people off the internet with his flying monkeys if they say anything negative about the manor at all. He basically scares them into submission. And honestly, I remember when I made my original McKamey Manor video four years ago when I was just a wee YouTube lass that I was careful to not speculate too much or make any claims about what goes on in there. Or if I was to address claims, I'd be playing devil's advocate alongside those claims. And it was all because I was too scared to be deemed a hater. And now I don't give a shit. They can try to run me off the internet, but it's not gonna work. <laughs> anyway though, according to legal professionals, in the case of gross or criminal negligence, a waiver won't protect Russ if someone were to get seriously injured or even die. Reasonable negligence would be like, if someone slips on a wet floor at a water park, they probably can't sue them for damages. However, if a water slide at that same water park isn't being inspected regularly, it gets all rusted and wobbly, and then also they never filter the water, so there's dangerous bacteria there, and someone goes down that slide and it breaks while they're riding it and they get seriously injured, and then they also find out that they've been infected with E. coli while they're being treated for their injuries, yeah, that would not fall under reasonable negligence, and that person would have an easier time suing for damages. In Russ's case, if he waterboards someone to the point where they drown or he locks somebody in a freezer filled with freezing cold water and they get hypothermia and die, Russ is royally fucked. Also, it's very important to remember that consent can be revoked at any time, especially in cases of abuse. That all being said, I would definitely say that there was a case to be had against Russ 10 years ago during his scorcher days because he was regularly putting people in the hospital. He was breaking people's bones, causing people like Lori Brotherton to endure years of therapy to work through the trauma she experienced in McKamey Manor. And I know she's not the only one. Today, there are a few things that I think could still fall under gross negligence in my non-legal professional opinion. He had this uh, freezer. It was an old uh, chest type deep freezer. I don't know if people know what the, like you've seen these, these freezers that are huge, full of muddy water that he never changed, but he would make people get in this uh, deep freezer of nasty water. And he, he never changed it from person to person. Like somebody's coming this week, he'd rinse it out. No, none of that ever happened. So people would get in this thing and puke, spit, whatever. He just kept adding them to it. The dirty ass fucking deep freeze 
that Jonathan was referring to, Ew. Russ actually had calls to the health department about mm-hmm. about his uh, quote unquote manner. And he was actually told, you have to change that water and clean and disinfect that freezer or you're going to be fine, buddy. It was that gnarly, you guys, to where he was oh, going yeah. to get a fine from the health department for it. So OSHA has guidelines that say if you work in an environment with a high chance of exposure to bloodborne pathogens, that you have to acquire a certificate that says you've been trained to comply with OSHA's bloodborne pathogen safety standards. This usually applies to people who work in the medical field, but it can also apply to tattoo artists, body piercers, microblading specialists, estheticians, like stuff like that. And I'm pretty sure that that certification has to be regularly reinstated. Like you have to go and redo the training pretty often but russ does regularly injure people just not as intentionally as he used to he still force feeds people nasty stuff but it's like sardines and stuff it's not like dog poop anymore but i don't know people don't vomit as much eating sardines versus dog poop. You can still vomit from drowning though, or overexertion. But one other thing he definitely still does is cut people's hair, and then he doesn't clean it up. In this video, before he starts cutting this woman's hair, you can see a pile of hair from other contestants that hasn't been cleaned up. Like, these are disgusting conditions all the way around. The water he has people wade through and sit in is nasty and clearly unsanitary. If he's no longer physically injuring people by force, he could still make someone sick with this shit. Carol debunks Russ's claims that he makes about his time in the military. When Russ talks about it, he makes it sound like he was this top-level mind control agent who was tasked with hypnotizing people and giving all that information to the Navy. I was in the military for 23 years and my specialty, I was called the counselor and I used to work at what they call black sites. I don't know if you know what a black site is. It's where we Okay, so my specialty is mind control, hypnosis, uh, medication, and things like that. That's my ace up my sleeve is, uh, is the hypnosis, for example. So it's really difficult to get through this place because people think, you can't hypnotize me, Russ. I go, well, okay, but I'll do it without them even knowing it. Hey. And I'll, I'll sit them in a kiddie pool at three inches of water and tell them there's a great white shark in there with them. And they'll be freaking out thinking there's a shark in this little kid's pool. So it's difficult to get around that. Carol says that's not the case at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You mean like the MK Ultra and all of that? But he's like a, got top secret clearance and all that stuff. Russ was a Bozeman mate. He's like the guy who blew the whistle on the ship. He got out of the Navy. He was in for 22 years. He got out of the Navy, and when he got back in, then he was like the guy who would go around and recruit guys to sign up again for like another four years. He doesn't know anything about MK Ultra. He doesn't know anything about hypnosis. He doesn't know anything. Zero nothing. And then there's the claim that no one has ever won the prize money because not only is there no prize money, there's also just not a haunt. Carol tells us that Russ specifically makes sure that he pushes people in any way that he needs to to make sure that no one ever makes it to the end. So if there isn't a real haunt in the actual manner that Russ describes doesn't exist, then what is going on there? Well, I've compiled a list of videos that I can find of these stunts that Russ has on his property. Russ has names for every stupid little activity that he has people do. So now, here's video proof of the truth of what happens behind the doors of McCamey Manor. Here it is, the crazy truth behind McCamey Manor and its extreme stunts. Come on. Yeah, it looks extreme and scary, right? Why are you so slow? Well, before you can even get to the manor, Russ has you go live in the Facebook group multiple times to do tasks. It's his kind of initiation to make sure that the people he has going through the manor are serious and dedicated and totally not haters. For example, I guess he told this big, hairy, manly guy to dress like a little sissy girl. I'm such a sweet little girl. And that's why Russ 
I'm just, I'm just a little sweet girl, man. I can't go through this hardcore tour. Or like this guy, the one that I was suspecting that is friends with Reckless Ben, that is totally friends with Reckless Ben. Uh, he had to submerge himself underwater for 30 seconds, five times. A lot of the times he just tells people to do jumping jacks or push-ups. First, I have to do 50 push-ups, and then 20 sit-ups, and then 20 jumping jacks. And of course, he always wants to see people do some kind of public humiliation, like going to the dollar store and dancing to NSYNC. I mean, so much singing or dancing in public. <laughs> And then the day before someone's tour, he makes them go live in the Facebook group every 15 to 20 minutes all night so he can prove that these people have been sleep deprived and kept up all night. Yeah, that's another thing that Russ does. He just makes sure that you're too exhausted to complete literally anything. Once you actually get to the manor, Russ starts every tour with what he calls boot camp. The reality is boot camp is the only thing Russ has on his property. The point of boot camp, according to Russ, is so that he can see what limits he can push you to, and then determines if you're physically and mentally capable of entering the real manor. Spoiler alert, no one's even made it to the manor! What boot camp is about, it's a way for me to evaluate what you can do during the real show. I do not want somebody to get hurt during the real show, so I'm going to find out what kind of physical limitations you have. That way I can address that and put the show according to you, okay? Because we don't want somebody to be mentally or physically hurt during the real show. Russ will always make sure you're so exhausted or you've been drowned and waterboarded so much that you have no choice but to quit. Some stunts don't even have an objective, so there's nothing to beat. He claims that if you beat certain objectives he gives you, that's when you get to go to the real manner. I have spent way too much time trying to find out all the names of these stunts. The problem is that there isn't an official list of stunts with descriptions. I've only ever heard people talk about like this stunt or that stunt. And I fail to understand how any of those people even know what any of those stunts even are. But anyway, Russ's flying monkeys are gonna show up and be like, lol, what this girl said is clearly not true because she said that stunt is oblivion when it's not and it's okay listen to those people i say i have literally spent days trying to find out the names of these stupid stunts and searching them in the facebook group and trying to pair them up with footage and trying to piece this part of the video together like a puzzle and at the end of it whether or not i've correctly matched up the names with its corresponding stunt is completely and ultimately irrelevant. And if that is the deal breaker for you in this video, you're worried about the wrong shit, my guy. Anyway. What you'll notice in all of this footage is that these people are wearing a onesie when they show up to Russ's trailer. These are basically Russ's trophies. You know how like serial killers will keep something from each one of their victims as mementos? This is basically that for Russ. He demands that he keeps these onesies at the end of every tour and it looks like he hangs them up in a little room that he has called the morgue. He usually starts with squirting paint all over the contestants faces. It's so scary and so spooky. Beware of the following scary footage. Oh, you ready? Come some more. Come some more. Oh yeah. Look at that. I think it's pretty clear what this is for Russ. Let's call it what it is. He gets off on humiliating other people. But anyway, after this, Russ basically makes you exercise. He'll do things like make you crab walk with a 40 pound bag of dog food on your belly, or he'll make you slither around on the ground like a slithery snake or hop around like a frog, or drag a heavy object. Sometimes he'll make you drag him. And exercises like this can go on for hours. Pretty early on, Russ will attach a shock collar to contestants, where if they stop doing their exercises at any time, he'll just shock them. Considering how long this exercising portion can last, you could be the strongest person in the world with the world's best endurance. Eventually your body's gonna give out and you can't jumpstart yourself through electrocution anymore. This one is quick. There's a stunt called unyoked where two people smash eggs on each other's heads. Some of them are hard boiled. So the objective is to get the most yolk on the other person's head. And when they win, I don't know what that means. It probably has no relevance at all. Just more humiliation. So I see the term bloodbath get thrown around and I think that this is the stunt. Like it's exactly what it sounds like. 
Russ just pours fake blood all over your head. I've seen him claim that this is pig's blood, but come on. Where are you getting pig's blood, Russ? I'm not sure what this stunt is called, but he likes to make people put clothes pins all over your face. And I don't think there's any real objective here. Also, if you see a contestant wearing headphones, it appears as though Russ has them listening to a playlist on an iPod that he says has subliminal messages. I think it's Russ's attempt at hypnotizing people. So Russ wants us to believe he's some hypno wizard who's a master of mind games, but truthfully, he's just playing some stupid playlist for them. Russ might force feed you something gross, like sardines or pig's feet. Seal, go. Seal. You want some crickets now? I know nothing about this stunt except there's water involved somehow. Maybe something like a trust fall into water while wearing a straight jacket and a face mask. Anyway, I found this video of this guy Cecil who was Russ's helper for a while. He's not anymore, but he was telling us exactly what school's out is. Why is it called school's out? Because it was out. It was out. In this one, he dunks them in disgusting water and makes them shove foam body parts into this stupid little helmet. Russ says to beat this, you have to shove 17 of them in there. 17! That's physically impossible! Okay, so for this one, Russ straps this 50 gallon barrel onto the contestant's back. Usually he puts a bag of dog food in the barrel or something else that's heavy, and then he makes them crawl around his front yard while they're wearing it. Yeah, in this one, you literally just have to drag Russ around on a giant tire. If you've never tried to flip a tire like this, let me tell you, they are probably heavier than you think they are. Let's just add giant ass Russ on top of one. So this is a stunt that is apparently some elaborately built platform stunt that's allegedly 160 feet up in the air in some trees on Russ's property. That's what he says anyway. He's never shown any of that on camera before. The objective, from what I can understand, is that you have to jump from one platform to another one that's supposedly six feet away while you're blindfolded so you couldn't even see where or how far you'd be jumping in the first place. Then, assuming that you make it to the platform, you then have to do some kind of puzzle, and once you complete it, you're slingshotted like those bungee carnival rides that you always see videos of people passing out on. Oh, my week! So this is an extreme slingshot, like the kind you ride in. Have you have you ridden in one of those? I, I did back in high school, and okay. um, I was harnessed in with somebody, so I had somebody to like cling to while I was screaming my head off. Right. So there's a lot to debunk with this one. First of all, you can see the property that McKamey Manor lies on on Google Maps. I'm not gonna show it to you in this video because I think that that's part of the reason why one of Reckless Ben's videos about McKamey Manor got taken down because Russ like does live on the property. So you could claim that there's like a privacy concern there. But I'll tell you this, not only can you not see any trees that appear to be anywhere near 160 feet tall, which by the way is about the height of a 10 story building. But I mean, if there were some elaborate platform stunt on Russ's property, you'd be able to see it on satellite view. If there was a slingshot, you would be able to see it. The fact of the matter is, there's nothing like that at all. Now, I have seen some comments in the group trying to explain what manor horn is. This commenter claims, it is walking some kind of plank system high up in the trees and also traversing different levels height-wise by jumping. Supposedly, the width where your feet go is super thin and it's all about balance and agility. It's like walking a multi-level tightrope system up in the trees with nothing but a harness and cable for safety. Also, I've heard him say there is some kind of game or puzzle to solve to get through different parts. The only videos that I've seen where people say that they've done it or that Russ is doing it like during daylight hours, they're just videos of Haley and Susan. So yeah, two women that he's been romantically involved with. He never actually shows the stunt on video though. In this video with Susan, you can see the background here. So it looks like they are up in a tree. 160 feet though? 
I'm not so sure about that. So if there really is a platform and cable system up in a tree somewhere, my speculation is that Russ just put a pallet up in a tree and says that it's six feet away, but then like when you look at it, you're like, that's definitely not six feet away. That's way farther. Like I couldn't even jump to it, even if I wanted to. In this video, Susan's not blindfolded. So I think personally that this was scripted and planned. I think Russ told her to pretend there's platforms and pretend she can't do it. I actually found a comment from Susan where she says, the first time I debated for 90 minutes blindfolded on a ledge in the dark. My second attempt, I jumped, I made it. But it is to date the scariest thing I've ever done. Ever. But conveniently, there's no video of this happening. We wouldn't even have to see her get into this supposed slingshot. Audio would be all we need. We would just need to hear her be like, ah! But no, we don't get anything like that. However, there are obviously plenty of videos filmed from the grounds on Russ's property. I don't see a single tree that looks like it's not only 160 feet tall, but sturdy enough to safely build a platform stunt on. I call bullshit. Okay, this one's called Buried Alive, and I've seen clips of him saying that he will bury people under 6 to 12 feet of dirt. First of all, yes, that would be an accurate description of burying someone alive. But secondly, they would probably die either from the weight of the dirt on top of them or like suffocation. So instead, Russ just says that this is the baby version of Buried Alive. But in my opinion, it's the only version that Russ actually has and does. He just throws mud on your face. Sometimes there's a barrier between your face and the mud. Other times he's literally just throwing mud at you. Okay, so I think this one involves sitting in a trough with hardly any room to move around and breathe. Almost like that competition on Survivor where they have to stay in the water under a grate while the tide comes in, and then they have less and less room to breathe as the water rises. Well, in this one, I'm pretty sure Russ just tries to somehow simulate that in a trough. They're also in a straight jacket and chained up for this stunt. The objective is to get yourself out of a straight jacket, find some keys, get out of this padlock cage thing, and get out of the stunt. However, as if getting out of a straight jacket isn't nearly impossible enough, try doing it in a confined space in cold water. Nope, no way. I'm not even convinced that there are any keys to be found. So the objective would be impossible anyway. <laughs> There's no keys. I can't find the keys. I can't turn. There's several keys in there. You can't turn. You gotta get out of the jacket then yeah, where you yeah. can feel it. There's no keys. The morgue is an indoor location where Russ has set up one of those autopsy tables. The videos of this place make me really think that most of the people in Russ's videos these days are overacting. Like, as if Russ told them before he goes live, like, hey, you need to act so scared. Put on a show. Because in this video, these people are just laughing. It must not be that scary. <laughs> <laughs> And this is where he usually does the stunts I debunked earlier. You get to experience injections via retractable needles, the slice, which is a dull box cutter that squirts fake blood on you, the chainsaw where Russ puts a prop chainsaw next to your face, the drill where Russ puts a foam drill in your mouth, the dentist where Russ threatens to pull your teeth out with plastic pliers, axle grease where Russ says he's putting axle grease on your face, but I mean, it really just kind of looks like a clay face mask. Maybe it's real axle grease, I don't know. The morgue is also where Russ cuts people's hair, or he forces people to cut their own hair. It doesn't appear that he ever cleans this table either, because in this video you can see a woman with dark brown hair lying on top of hair that clearly came from someone else because it's blonde. This is obviously an unsanitary environment. It's disgusting. In this one, Russ straps a nasty rusty box to your head and sprays water into it and you're supposed to just sit and take it. This is another thing that doesn't appear to have an objective. It's not like you can just learn to breathe underwater and hold your breath for several hours or endure waterboarding for an extended period of time. So this is the two mile long zip line that Russ says totally exists. <laughs> that totally does not exist. 
All I can find are speculative comments like this. My best guess based on watching every video that has been put out is that it's some kind of head first zip line with near misses and sections very close to the ground. But I am certain that there is more to it than that, which we have no way to find out without taking a tour. First of all, there isn't a single video of Russ claiming that someone is attempting it. And secondly, when you Google longest zip line in the world, it says the Guinness world record holder for the world's longest zip line is 1.7 six miles long. Thirdly, even if we're expected to believe that Russ secretly does have this massive zip line on his property. Okay, remember when I said that you can see the property that McCamey Manor lies on on Google Maps? Well, Google Maps has this feature where you can literally just like measure anything from satellite view. And when you do this, you can find that the widest part of Russ's property is only about 450 feet. And one mile is 5,280 feet. So his property is hardly an eighth of a singular mile at its widest part. So where, pray tell, would you fit a two mile long zip line, Russ? <laughs> It all makes sense why there's no videos of anyone ever doing this stunt because it's just physically impossible for it to even exist. Not on Russ's property anyway. Also, also, I have ziplined before. It's fun as hell. What is the zipline doing in a haunted house? Okay, so this one I might have actually gotten the name wrong for. I've also seen the term down the rabbit hole used to describe a stunt like this. So I wanna say that they're related for obvious reasons. From what I can tell though, and from looking at a satellite view of his property, it looks like Russ has dug out some trenches. There's some sort of structure with a drain pipe aimed down into the trenches. So the contestant goes down the rabbit hole. And when they get to explore the trenches, I guess that's Wonderland. That's basically all I've gathered from it. I think they're supposed to find a key or a puzzle or something while they crawl around in the trench, but I've never seen anyone actually do that. In this same tunnel trench area, the stunt seems to be something along the lines of the contestant needs to crab walk through the muddy, nasty water looking for a baby bottle in the mud. I don't think there really is a baby bottle in the mud though because Russ makes them climb back up through the drain pipe while he sprays them in the face with a hose and he says they have to do it on their belly. They're not supposed to crawl, so how is that even physically possible? But in this video, he just throws the baby bottle at the contestant while she's trying to climb up this pipe blind folded and soaking wet, and then she bashes the baby bottle on the side of the tunnel. So I guess that's it? So Russ has built another drain pipe down into the dirt where he harnesses the contestant and lowers them into the pipe. There are red numbers spray painted onto the wall, which are supposed to be the numbers that open the combination lock at the bottom. Russ then sprays the contestant with the hose again while they're supposed to be figuring out this puzzle. In this video, it's obviously pretty dark and the contestant says that she can't see the lock. Supposedly, if a contestant is successful in unlocking the lock and opening a hatch, then they'll be met with Spectrum, the 200 yard underwater maze filled with alligators. Shockingly, I haven't seen a single account of someone opening any hatch or entering any kind of crazy underwater maze. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that that is because there is no hatch. Maybe the combination that's written on the walls there, those numbers don't even open the lock at all, so no one could even open it even if they had paid attention to all of the numbers that are circling around them while they're being lowered into the tube. And I also can't imagine that it's legal to own a pet alligator in Tennessee, let alone multiple alligators. <laughs> it would probably be considered animal cruelty to keep them locked away underground like that all the time. The stunt oblivion clearly exists. We have video evidence of it, but it just doesn't lead to anything. So therefore spectrum doesn't exist. The last stunt I'm gonna go over here is Rat Race, and you'll understand why I'm ending with this one in a second. Basically, Rat Race is this cage maze thing built a couple feet above the ground where the contestant has to crawl on their back like a snake while blindfolded in a straitjacket while Russ sprays you in the face with a hose. Supposedly, you're supposed to find a key and unlock the gate to make the water stop spraying on you. When Reckless Ben went through his manor tour, he actually made it to where he was supposed to, and then the cage broke. I think I broke it, so I, I was okay. like forever, so I had to tap. I think this is kind of hilarious based on what Carol said about Russ leaving this 
cage and other things on her property in the freezing Midwest winter, she mentions how rusted, rotted, and unsafe these props are, and Ben freaking broke it. So why do they call it Rat Race? Well, according to Russ, here's how he describes what Rat Race is. When you do Rat Race, once you find a plexiglass container full of the, the mice, the clock starts. You need to find a plexiglass container inside the maze that you're going to be in. You're going to be in a maze. Once you find it, you're going to slide down about two feet and you're going to find a key. You're going to pull the key. Once you pull the key, then a teeter board will flip over and release. I don't even know how many. Huh. How many? I have no idea. I don't know how many. But you're going to find mice. They're field mice. They're not going to bite you. They're not. They don't have rabies, nothing like that, okay? Uh -huh. So they're going to fall on you. At that point in time, take off your hood. Use the key, open up the other side of Rat Race. When you're in the second part, the second maze, it is electrified. There's gonna be water every time you open a gate. A gate means it's the area that you're going to either go forward or back in to move through the maze. So every time you open that gate, it releases water. Once the gate is secured, then the water is secured. So once you get through the second section, the electrified section of Rat Race, then there's a third section. There's no electricity in there, but there's some other things that I cannot tell you about. That's right, electrocution, a container full of mice, hundreds of mice falling onto your face, other things that Russ cannot tell you about. Sounds intense, right? Well, unfortunately for Russ, there's not only video evidence of what this stunt actually is, it's just another part of his property that you can see pretty clearly on satellite imagery. It's just that old, nasty, rusty cage that Carol was talking about that Ben busted when he went through it. There's no plexiglass container full of mice. There's no second part of the maze that electrocutes you. There's not a trap door that will drop rodents onto your face. There's not a third mystery stage. There's only this cage, and Russ stands on top of it and sprays you in the face with a hose. Russ essentially waterboards you while you try to open these little gates until you can't breathe, so it's impossible to get to any sense of an end here. Russ claims that making it to the end of this maze and finding the mice and then tugging on the supposed key will start the clock, and then the real manner starts. The only thing that this proves to me, and probably anyone else with a, a singular logical working brain cell <laughs> in their head, you can see that this is the extent of the McCamey Manor experience. There's no real manor. There's only Russ on his property, putting you in unsanitary containers that he most likely never cleans, and trying to drown you until you have no choice but to quit. That is the real McCamey Manor. But hey, it could be really easy to prove us haters wrong. All he'd have to do is show us a mouse. Just one mouse. He supposedly has enough of them to fill a plexiglass container full of them and then to dump them all over your face, right? Like, if you can get this unflattering close-up angle of Ben and keep calm, you could literally give us that same angle looking into the plexiglass container full of mice that you supposedly have. Hold one mouse and show us that you have them, Russ. You supposedly have alligators in your underwater haunted house, right? And those alligators have to eat, right, Russ? Just show us the process of you feeding an alligator. But he won't because he doesn't have them. I'm not gonna give away everything that Reckless Ben and his crew are doing. I highly recommend watching his series for yourself. Unfortunately, part two of his series got mass reported by Russ's cult and <laughs> got taken off of YouTube. So the only place that you can watch part two is on his Patreon, which by all means, go support him there. He's doing some great stuff. But if you don't wanna do that, there's still three parts up on his YouTube channel that you can watch for free. All you really need to know though is that Ben has basically challenged Russ on everything. He's gone through the manor, he's gotten three of his friends to go through the manor, he changed Russ's contract and waiver before he signed it so that he's basically legally absolved of a majority of the things that he's been doing to Russ. He registered McCamey Manor as an LLC under his name so now he technically owns McCamey Manor as a business. <laughs> he's made it very easy for Russ to challenge Ben legally and Russ has has yet to take any sort of civil action against him, although he did call the cops on them in the last attempt when they sent that Nathan guy through for trespassing, and they didn't get arrested, so. 
I don't think Russ is gonna take any civil action against Ben or anyone for that matter because lawyers are hella expensive. <laughs> I know having the cops called on them isn't gonna be enough to stop Ben and I'll be following Ben closely. I think we all should follow Ben closely as he goes through his mission to infiltrate and dismantle McKamey Manor. And I think this is a pretty damn good place to end it, you guys. I'll stay on top of the McKamey Manor disaster. I actually, between now and Halloween, would like to do some live streams watching some of the like interviews of people who have gone through McKamey Manor and stuff. I know you guys have missed the live streams and I have too. I will almost certainly be kicked out of the Facebook group after this video, but we'll play it all by ear and see where it all goes. But let's hope that Russ will finally be exposed for the monster that he is once and for all. And before I end this video, I do want to talk about my Patreon and my memberships real quick. So I have a postcard club. You guys have heard me talk about it a lot. For the month of December, I have decided that if you are in one of the tiers, that they'd be the top two tiers, that would normally receive postcards from me. I'm going to be sending out hand-painted rocks of mine instead for December. This will only apply to any members that are in the continental United States and its territory. So if you're international, I'm sorry, I can't send you a painted rock. It's too expensive and I can't afford it. <laughs> but if you're already in one of those tiers and you're international, I know I have, I think, two or three of you guys. If you're already there and you've received postcards from me in the past, I'll send you a rock. Just no new international people. But if you're in the United States or one of their territories and it's not going to cost me an arm and a leg to send you a rock, you can make sure that you are joined by December 1st and then yeah I'll send you a freaking rock man. Now specifically I just want to thank the people who are already members of mine. The list of names I'm about to read off are either on Patreon or YouTube members. They get access to our private Discord server which is pretty much the only place you can even message me anymore because I turned all my DMs off on social media because I got overwhelmed. <laughs> And then, like I mentioned, there's the Postcard Club. Sometimes even more than that. So if any of that sounds good to you, you can go to patreon.com slash savannahmarie or you can click the join button beneath this video to join my YouTube memberships. Just whatever works for you works for me. And with that, the biggest thank you in the whole wide world goes to Hula Chowdown, Jacqueline Nutton, Elizabeth Wyatt, Kessie Drew, Leanne, Caroline Reed, Charlotte Treese, Daniel Urena, Maddie Darley, Ray, Turd Ferguson, Love to Be Evil, Martine Hubert, Amber Price, Baby Pink Pearl, Alice Wagner, Laura Jensen, Miss Blue, Carol Campbell, Ari, Amy Louise, Mira S.I.K., LaSalle Story, Mother Dragon, 82, Fallon Lowry, Hannah, Carrie Kay, The Best Elephant, Jessica Billhart, Emion, and Auntie Lou. And to the rest of my financial supporters, thank you so much for being here and for being you. And even if you're not a financial supporter, thanks for making it to the end of this video. The YouTube algorithm loves when you do that, so thank you. Keep making waves, babes, and I'll smell you all later. Mommy Tsunami, out. <laughs>